Hey everybody, welcome to Nature Chat. This is the show after the show where we recap the previous episode of Nature Check and uh, talk with one of our players or in the future one of our guests about themselves and what happened in the episode and all kinds of good stuff. Um, So in episode two, which just happened, uh, the player characters had um, fought with some brigands in a bar and then they had a conversation with um, one of the gentlemen who works for the Royal Academy of Explorers. And so... um, Um, Episode two started with them having just finished the conversation with that guy and sort of having agreed that they would all work together on um, a mission for him after uh, working on the problem that Cedric had encountered when he first entered New Sagester, namely um, the young lady in the brothel who seemed to need some sort of rescuing. Um, So the group set off and were armed to the teeth and ready to bust into this brothel and just sort of like, you know, storm the castle, rescue her. And they were dissuaded from that by um, one of Kay's friends who also lives in New Seychester. Um, So then they were like, "Mm, maybe we should take a more subtle approach and do some recon and figure out what's going on. So uh, the group elected Lucanus <laughs> to go in and um, and uh, see what was up because, of course, they couldn't send Cedric back in or he would um, obviously be recognized by the brothel owner and that probably wouldn't be so great. Um, so, yeah, they sent uh, Lucanus in and he did his best impression <laughs> of a dirty, uncouth barbarian, which was great. Um, he had a conversation, a long conversation with the girl who we found out her name is Carissa and that she needed the, um, PCs to sort of go find a magical herb of some kind to help her, uh, manifest her, uh, the form or her true form, perhaps we could phrase it that way. Um, so that she could return to her mother's people and not have to work in the brothel anymore. Um, they, uh, after, collecting all that information. It was kind of late in the evening. So everybody found a place to sleep for the night. And then they reconnected at uh, the marked bird tavern the next morning. They went to the apothecary Carissa had mentioned, uh, who was very pleasant and helpful. And uh, the apothecary Elsa was able to direct them to where they needed to go to find this magical herb, which uh, grows in a seagrass bed um, by the beach kind of outside of the city. So they marched down the beach and they found the seagrass bed And just as they had entered the seagrass bed, um, two figures um, with weapons appeared in the water. Um, And so that is where we left off. And when we start episode three, the PCs will be in some combat, which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So that's that's what happened in episode two. Um, But yeah, we're here with uh, Peter, who plays Cedric, and we wanted to hear a little bit more about um, how Cedric has been feeling about all of this stuff that has happened to him in episodes one and two, um, and sort of how you came about developing Cedric. And you certainly don't have to tell us any secrets you don't want to tell us about your character yet. (laughs) There's there's been a lot of, even just within the two episodes, there's been a lot of uh, character development with Cedric, which I feel is fascinating. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Cedric is a, is a fun play, uh, character to play. Um, I so uh, I mean, do you, should we talk about uh, how I developed him or or how he's feeling currently? First? You can but, you can talk first. about those in either order. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. This so this episode I got to take a little bit more of a back seat. Um, I I got to kind of dominate the the, the episode the first time. Um, but, uh, but this one, I mean, Luke Canis really got to, to shine a little bit more as far as, uh, moving the plot forward. Um, Cedric is a, is a simple man, um, in a lot of ways, you know, he's, he's, a. so, so when I, when I designed uh, Cedric, it was as a, oh, sorry, I've got a visitor again. <laughs> Aw, kitty. Oh, kitty. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, to be completely honest, um, I, I'm the care, I'm the player that has the most experience with D and D. And so I, I felt like it was, uh, something that I could do to help out, to wait until the end, figure out kind of what our party needed before designing my character. And, uh, when Cheryl told me that we didn't have a, a healer yet, I was like, oh, well, you know, Cedric seems like a, a, a good character. You know, I can, I can, I can play a cleric. Um, and, I, and I love the kind of naive, uh, pa- but but passionate cleric uh, character, um, and and so you know, Cedric has a has a very good heart, um, a lot of lofty goals, uh, but a 
limited worldview. Um, and so I don't know, he, he comes, he comes very naturally to me uh, as, as, you know, I've, I've, I've been there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all have. It's it's sort of the nature of being a scientist, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like I feel like a lot of people can really relate to that. Of like, oh, I'm I'm a good person. I'm a good person. You know, like I I know what I'm doing. I'm just gonna <laughs> go out there and, and be a good person, and people will treat me well, and and you know, everything will just kind of work out on its own. Uh, and so Cedric has has kind of that attitude. Um, and uh, so yeah, so this was a, this was a good episode because it, you know I, I it said I mean he's not, he's naive but he's not an idiot right so yeah. like with Lucanus it's like no it makes sense to do a little bit of recon I can go into this place very easily and do recon yeah uh, I mean and- there's there's no way Cedric can just kind of I mean there's no way Cedric can uh, ignore that right it's like oh yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. That makes sense. Well, I the the thing that I really like about Cedric is, um, you know, you mentioned that conversation between us, and it really gives um, a lot for me to play off of with my character um, because I mean, we talked a little bit about how I develop my character, which I'm not really quite ready to put out there in public, although I almost just did because <laughs> of that technical error at the end of the last episode, <laughs> but. Um, uh, that conversation, I feel, was really... Re- well, so a lot of the things that have happened in this episode, I feel, have been really revealing because you can sort of see Cedric quickly becoming like, oh, shit, what have I gotten myself into? Um, especially with the uh, uh, um, battle at the tavern in the first episode and then seeing how he dealt with it um, in this episode. And um, uh, the... I feel like there's a very sort of dynamic because a very sort of dynamic things because um, Lucanus and Cedric are sort of operating as this sort of horseshoe, you know, Um, they, they obviously have very similar passions and beliefs and um, stuff like that. But Lucanus has sort of been around for a little bit more and has probably had his ass kicked a little bit more. And, um, (laughs) Because of that, with certain things, he's like, um, with certain things, he's like, oh shit, this is not how things are done. And in this episode, I sort of feel like he really helped Cedric um, get get on his way to completing his goals without getting into too much trouble, at least now. (laughs) I'm glad you pointed out the relationship between your characters because, yeah, as as the DM, having perfect knowledge of what's going on with the party and stuff, and I'm certainly not going to reveal anything, but <laughs> there's there's two really interesting pairs of, like, opposites in the party, and this, like, yeah. the interesting dichotomies between the two pairs of characters, I'm just, like, so here for those because, yeah, like, I think between, between Lucanus and Cedric, like, you're very similar and yet opposite. And that's, I'm just so excited to see that develop and like see those characters, like learn how to work with one another. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that happened in this episode. They're like, Oh, like we can do things kind of both ways. Yeah. Well, and then as the characters develop, I feel like that's going to change because um, with, from what I understand of, uh, uh, um, Oh crap. What's his Ryan's character's name? Fletcher. Fletcher. With Fletcher's motivations and Lucanus's, I feel like one of the interesting things is going to be Fletcher's motivations versus Lucanus's um, race, class, and personal history. Um, when we sort of start exploring that, that's going to get very interesting very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not going to say more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert! No, I think I think uh, Fletcher is a natural uh, kind of. Uh, interaction for Cedric because all the other characters are, are human or human seeming and uh, and Cedric is a dwarf but I, I mean again naive Cedric grew up in a in a culture that is, is primarily dwarf and has very little interaction with other species um, and so I feel, I feel like as the as the other, species out the odd species out you're gonna we're well, gonna kind of naturally form kind of a little bit of a, a pairing within the group 
Um, and so uh, I think Cedric is gonna is gonna seek that as a, like a little bit of a like, you know, hey man, these these humans are really weird. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you did ask that in the first episode, didn't you? After after the, after the fight was over, you were like, "Is this normal human behavior?" Like, <laughs> and I, I don't think that's gonna gonna come back up again. I mean, part, <laughs> part of the part of the mythology that we've established for Moradin is that um, that that dwarves view themselves as being made out of like basically uh, better stuff than everyone else. Yeah, and and so you know everyone else is like lower, you know. But but I, I think. Um, you know, I mean, if you get into, you know, metallurgy, you start thinking about different metals as being made up, you know, having different qualities, you know, yeah. so like, oh, you know, like, even though something is, you know, say made out of, you know, it's not, it's not pure, it's not pure iron or whatever. It's, yeah. it's more base metals, you know, oh, maybe those base metals have some redeeming qualities. Maybe they can be mixed into an alloy or something like that. And so I think, I think that's, that's kind of percolating in the back of, 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 of <laughs> Cedric's brain but like you know uh, you know i'm holding you at a distance i, I want to kind of explore explore what makes up all these different people and um so there's a lot of prejudice that comes along with yeah. you know, C- C- cedric's background but but he's he's coming at it with he's he's got w- good intentions but a lot of prejudice so he's got an open mind but yeah it's yeah it's, it's gonna be that's, interesting to kind of continue to explore that that's a beautiful metaphor the the different metallurgy stuff and i also i as a dm i really appreciate that like it's obvious that you've taken some time to like think about metallurgy terms to date <laughs> yeah. uh in the in episode two you said something about scraping the bottom of the slag bucket and i was like <laughs> oh man he's really going for it so yeah like well, i and it's then, it's so nice and believable and like you know adds a third dimension to the world to be like oh yes I'm a dwarf and also like I've taken the time to add all of this vocab vocabulary to my language so that like it makes it so believable I really like it. Yeah. Well, and then the um, conversation with Brother Hammer, who I really made fun <laughs> of this episode. <laughs> that, that was like I, don't, like, I felt I felt re- so like I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> Not develop this mythology enough to get to work through this situation that I have yeah. very clearly put myself into. Like, yeah. Hello, I would like to go to this place. Hmm. I don't know what I'm going to say here. Though. Yeah. Oh well, no, no. The, the conversation. Kind of like um, the first time I ever opened R, and I was just like, mm, "What do yeah. I do now?" <laughs> yeah. No. Um, I mean, the conversation with brother with uh, uh, brother was it brother Hammer or Father Hammer? Father Hammer. I don't father know. I, I think we're using <laughs> Hammer in place of Father, but whatever. Yeah. But the conversation last week when you talked about humans being made of a different metal, I just thought that was I just thought that was brilliant, and I wasn't sure where you were going with that, and. Um, uh, yeah. you've obviously gone some really cool and interesting places with it. Well, yeah. part of that was, part of that was Cheryl, you know, like, yeah. we're, I think, I think we're developing the mythology together, which is, which yeah. is really fun. Well, and like, I joked, like I was raised agnostic and then I decided to build a D and D world where like <laughs> God, gods aren't like just a thing like they are in normal D and D, but yeah. now there are like multiple denominations for each of the gods. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, what have I gotten myself into? Yeah. Right? So I'm like, how do I make differences between their beliefs. I don't really yeah. under, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say, I don't know enough about world religions to like do a good job of like making the, and besides the fact that the D and D pantheon is huge. So it's like, yeah. Oh, we have to have Orthodox Morden and reformed Morden and Orthodox yeah. Paylor and reformed Paylor <laughs> and Orthodox Hieronius and reformed Hieronius. And I can keep going. Cause there's like, like if you, if you were like, Nancy has the, Nancy has the map for new Sagester, but like, if you ever get a, if you guys ever get a map of new Sagester or maybe I'll post it at some point for the viewers to see that like the the church district of New Sagester is huge and there are so <laughs> many boxes in there because there have to be like one of each kind of church and that's a lot. Yeah. Um which yeah. Like, um yeah, so so coming up with the belief systems for each of them was really interesting. And yeah, Morden was the first that I thought about because yeah, we've got Cedric and and yeah, the uh, Cedric belongs to the more orthodox um denomination of the followers of Morden. So yeah, they've got this very strict um that the dwarves were forged first of all of the races and out of the purest metals of the earth. 
and that all of the other races were subsequently created by the other gods out of lesser materials. And that, yeah, there's this weird thing where like, oh yeah, the dwarves see themselves very much like apart and very, you know, pure and they are the best craftsmen. And, you know, it's, a, it's very much like a, a superiority or superlative sort of um, situation. And that's not true of the reformed followers of Moradin. Um, but Cedric wouldn't necessarily know a whole lot about the differences between those two. I don't, I don't two. pay it much attention to heresy, you know. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but like Cedric will, Cedric will definitely um, notice, or it will be pointed out to Cedric um, when people uh, deviate from some of the practices of the Orthodox for followers of Morden. And so he might eventually sort of come to understand some of the differences in their belief systems because uh, he's described his starched white shirt and pressed pleated pants and, <laughs> and how he's got this very nice beard, but it's completely unadorned. And, and so these followers believe that, you know, you don't wear jewelry and you don't, you know, dye your beard and, you know, you have to keep everything very simple and clean and pure. Right. And uh, there might be other dwarves that don't think those things. And so they behave differently or they adorn their bodies differently. And like, that'll be re really interesting to see, you know, how you address that, because that's, that's a thing that is true in the real world with different religions as well. Right. How do we, how do we adorn our bodies or respect our bodies depending on what we believe? Yeah. Well, yeah. I am, I am also looking forward to finding out what all of that means. <laughs> yeah and i think i think even i mean going back to the 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 really basic uh mythology you know like the what are people made out of yeah um, is is something that you know is true in a lot of different world religions you know in our world and i i, I love that as you know the origin story and and you know thinking about the differences between different groups you know and thinking you know oh you know we're better than these people because of blah 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 you know it's it's i think it's something that's um, it, it comes very, I don't know, naturally to people to divide, yeah. um, you know, to separate. Um, and so, so I don't know, it's, it'll be something that's fun to explore. That's yeah. one of the things that fascinates me. Um, like <laughs> I might be an ecologist, but I say this all the time. You can't separate the human element from ecology. And, um, I think that, you know, human behavior and human psychology is so fascinating. And yeah, this idea that like, um, we feel very strongly, we need to belong to a group and like mm -hmm. have this, like, you know, this mindset and like all of these things that make us part of a group. And so, yeah, you're right. We do, we do like to separate ourselves. And I think again, like that's something that D and D lends itself very well to because of these different races and different ideologies. And it had me thinking back to like the, the Silmarillion and, and origin stories and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and it also people also come together. I mean, we're not we're not necessarily a species that divides. I mean, everybody everybody can find something in another culture that they appreciate. I mean, you know, every, like um, Indian food or you know authentic Mexican food. There's a fantastic uh, uh, um, taqueria here that like the beef tongue and tripe tacos are. Oh. They are like I they are my favorite things on the menu. Um, they're in weird. Wyoming. Yeah. Well, nice. Online. Excellent. I mean, it's heavily agricultural, so. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, and, like, a lot of the things that sort of bring, that sort of, like, and, again, I'm sort of basing on the interplay between our two characters because they are polar opposites, but they're sort of brought, brought to similar places. And the places that, um, the places that, like, Cedric is coming from is from a very rigid upbringing, whereas mm -hmm. Lucanus is literally the exact opposite. A lot of his, a lot of the things that have caused him to reach these sort of places are more traumatic experiences. Um, yeah, and yeah. you guys both sort of um, <laughs> took the scenic route to get to <laughs> the, the tavern so that we could meet everyone yeah. um, in episode one and. Oh goodness! I think those are are those fireworks. I think there are fireworks happening. Yep, there are fireworks happening in my neighborhood. Okay. I really I love it when people set off illegal fireworks. My dog loves it. Wildlife love it. You know, if you want to learn more about why fireworks are a terrible idea, you should watch my episode or my video episode about that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> yes. Now my dog is quietly panicking. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So you guys sort of took the scenic route to the tavern, and yeah, uh, Cedric. There were a lot of sort of um, people were saying that people were stepping on your stepping on your groove or, or um, breaking your spirit. So yeah, how did how did Cedric feel about winding up in this new place and just 
having everybody react so negatively well, I, to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was this was so <laughs> much for Cedric to deal with. I mean, uh, right off the bat, right? <laughs> um, he, I mean, again, he knew that he was going into uh, an, an untamed land with uh, a bunch of other races, you know, that were uncultured and you know weren't yeah. as uh, as as sophisticated and civilized as the dwarven culture that he grew up in, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, but but yeah. So but it was so much worse than he expected, right? Like the very first thing <laughs> he encounters is this woman that he perceives to be, you know, held in slavery, which is you know a horrible thing. Yeah. Um, and then you know he's like, oh well, there are you know these are the people obviously that I will I will turn to for recourse. The church, the people that I literally rely on that I built my entire life around, you know, seeking justice, <laughs> go to them and they're like, eh, 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 not our problem. <laughs> and then, you know, to, to turn to, you know, like good and law, you know, the, the two really, I mean, like we go to like the classic D and D like lawful good, you know, wanderings. Cedric is lawful good, right? Mm-hmm. So he goes to good and he goes to law and both of them are like, yeah, we're not really interested in helping you. I mean, that was soul crushing. And then to go to a tavern as a last resort, be in this brutal fight, and then like be like, oh, these people who are in the fight, <laughs> these are the people that I'm going to rely on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Strange yeah. bedfellows. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that drink that Cedric had, or, or bottle oh, yep. uh, that Cedric had, w- I mean, I feel like that was as. As well earned as, as any drink has ever been, and I yeah. like he had so much to process. And I think he he still really has uh, he's very very uncomfortable with the other members of the party. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and is does Cedric drink normally? He doesn't seem to me like someone who would, but I I think I, well that's your, that's your your human perception. <laughs> oh, it's my yeah. elven perception. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fair yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah. Cedric, Cedric grew up drinking, but in moderation. Okay, sure. Yeah. I mean, okay. the, it seems like a pretty standard part of dwarven culture to be like, oh yeah, like. And honestly, if we just think about the Middle Ages in general, like alcohol was a better form of beverage to consume than the water often. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Like, absolutely. Yeah, the yeah. The, my, the, the water in in mines is often contaminated with a lot of heavy metals and things like that. So you know, it, it makes more sense to bring in like a cider or you know something like yeah. beer or something like that. Yeah. See, so, I don't I don't know any of this because. <laughs> D&D. This, <laughs> this is my first D and D game, so that's all right. <laughs> making this up. I mean, you're allowed to. It's your character and yeah. your story, and you're the well, only dwarf. So there you go. Yeah, um, but we we yeah. choose our characters for a reason because there's a story that we all want to tell through our characters, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, this sort of thing really helps us understand where this character's backstory. Yeah, lies. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Like I, I mean, I'll say like growing up so i i grew up in in north carolina and um in a uh i grew up very intimate with the church but i think not in the way that most people expect uh, a church in north carolina to be I mean, it was a very um uh, very accepting open church uh, i grew up in the episcopal church and even particularly within the episcopal church a very liberal um, open-minded church, uh, but I was very intimately involved in the, the church, the way it worked, and um, you know, my, my mom worked at the church, and I went to the church camp, and um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I was I was involved in the church at, at an even a higher level. Um, I, like in when I was in high school, I met the uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, which was a big deal for me, is, which. If you are in the Episcopal Church, it's like the equivalent of the Pope in the Episcopal Church. Um, actually, I taught him how to high five, which is one of my my absolute <laughs> favorite <laughs> moments of my life. Yeah, I, I was like, uh, um, uh, I was with a bunch of other like youth who were meeting him, and and they were all like shaking his hand. And I was like, actually, you know, like this would be a cool story. Can I just have a high five? And he was like, what? And I was like, a high five, like. We hold up hands and like slap them together. And he was like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, 
<laughs> I am so impressed that he didn't know what I thought. I know. Was. Like it was, I think it was just kind of a given that everybody knew it. And he oh, was just man. like, all right. That's so good. I yeah. love it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, but, but, you know, at the same time, like I always felt very, you know, oh, I'm, I'm one of the, one of the good guys. I'm very open-minded. You know, I, I felt that. Which I think a lot of people who grow up as like cis, straight, white dudes feel, right? Like I'm yeah. one of the good ones, you know, like, oh, I understand what it's like. I'm not a racist. I'm not a sexist. All of that stuff. And and I think, you know, so coming from that background, I feel like I, I understand Cedric very easily because yeah. like, that's who, who I've, I have been and I continue to be, right? Like it's yeah. like I'm just... I'm a couple of steps further down the road than Cedric, but but not yeah. you know, definitely not mm-hmm. all the way there yet. So um, so Cedric sort of mirrors your experience um, being being exposed to a lot more diverse cultures, especially outside the community that you came from. Absolutely. Okay. Nice. Absolutely. Yeah. And I I like what you said about the oh, the people at my church are supposed to be the good guys. And like I said um, before, you ran into um, an unexpected problem with that guy. And like, you didn't know because you didn't know him. You just knew he was the guy that was the head of that particular branch of the church. But um, he has some relationships which sort of complicate the whole idea of being the good guy. And this is not something that is unheard of in the church, right? This question of how how churches and politics sort of dance with one another is very interesting. And yeah. So, I mean, that guy, even if he had, you know, even if he wanted to help you felt like he couldn't because of extenuating circumstances in this weird, yeah, weird relationship between the church and politics. So I think that was a a really interesting thing to bring up that like, Oh, well, like what is good or like how, how does good get enacted? Um, yeah. Because good, good has to be enacted by people, mm-hmm. and people are complicated. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also, I also sort of made a joke <laughs> questioning Father Hammer's motives that I'm surprised yeah. um, <laughs> that bound it on down to pound down. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'd be lying if I said that I had been practicing that for two weeks because I knew that was coming up. <laughs> But uh, it was a solid joke. Yeah, solid joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Just alliteration in the pun. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. But no, no, no. I, I made that joke for a reason because, um, you, and I don't know where you're going with this storyline, Cheryl. But sometimes the motives of churches aren't pure. You know, we discuss a lot of that in episode mm-hmm. one, especially with Nancy and the Jesuits. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. Yep, and that definitely continues on to the modern day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, and and I think and I love to explore the kind of gray areas, right? Yeah, like that, that's the that's the thing is like, I feel like it's very uh, on the nose to be like, oh well, that we expect the church to be totally good, and obviously, <laughs> oh, the church is very bad; they're very super corrupt. But it's it's always more complicated than that. Yeah, right? like the church yeah. is completely full. Of people with good intentions and every everything is right like yeah. i mean academia i mean like to not to not to force the segue but like you know <laughs> i mean everyone in academia has good intentions right but there are so many times that politics or ego get in the way of yeah. whatever those intentions are or whatever those final goals should be or or you know yeah well- yeah. And it, it also brings up the question of like, what is good? I, I say this a lot and I think Thanos was a really great example of this, but like, oh, you know, the the mustache twirling, tying damsels to train track style villain. It's yeah, there you go. <laughs> is really easy to hate because like, oh, they're, you know, they're they're just bad. Right. They're they're bad for being bad. But someone like Thanos or like uh, Dolores Umbridge is another really great example. Those those bad guys are terrifying because they believe with their whole heart and being that they are doing what is right. Right. Well, they they believe that they are good. The, The best and scariest bad guy does not think that they are being bad. Right. And so that's that's another wrinkle to all of this is like, well, sure, everybody thinks they're on the right side and thinks they're good. So, like, how do you decide what is good and what is good ultimately often is just like your own opinion or (laughs) more appropriately rather um the opinion of the people who raised you and the group that you identify with right so like 
what is good becomes very complicated and difficult to navigate. Well, with um, with Thanos, and you know, I sort of <laughs> inserted the example uh, Eric Killmonger from the Black Panther movies. I feel like there's another step to that. So not only do those people, and I I don't remember Umbridge a whole lot, but but with oh, Thanos, how and can Killmonger, you not? How I know. Not remember Umbridge? Oh. Oh. I, I remember. <laughs> I whole time. <laughs> I remember Umbridge, um, but not so much her ideology, not enough to make the point that I'm about to make, which I think is a little bit more important than whether or not I remember <laughs> a character from the Harry Potter movies. But with with Thanos and Killmonger, what's, what's truly scary to me is not only the fact that they believe, but the fact that they have a point. Mm-hmm. And nobody, nobody in the entire world can cause change on... Nobody in the entire world can create change on a meaningful scale entirely by themselves. You need friends, you need allies, you need collaborators. And that's why I, you know, that's why I do a lot of the stuff that I do with other people because they bring in ideas. But the (laughs) fact, the fact that Killmonger and Thanos actually have that valid arguments, you know, you can, you can argue Killmonger and, Thanos' point um, and be able to convince a large amount of people, that is what gives them power. And the fact that they have power to actually to actually make these changes, that's what makes them effective. And the fact that they are effective to me is what makes them terrifying. Yeah. So and yeah, so so to sort of segue it back to Cedric, um, <laughs> he's sort of he's sort of realizing the uh, uh different or he's sort of realizing the value of creating and forming these allies and within the first few episodes even though as you put it he's naive i feel like he's doing something very smart he's looking outside of the traditional bounds of what he knows and is forming these relationships with people who are going to help him achieve his goals even if they're naive and short-sighted and maybe not being um, gone about it the right way, he's also, not only is he seeking these people out, he's also collaborating. He's <laughs> listening to ideas, and he is figuring out how to implement those ideas based on the feedback that he's receiving. I'm curious about something. Um, just thinking about, you said uh, he's cultivating relationships to help him achieve his goals. So Cedric's short-term goal is to help Carissa. Yeah. Right, this this damsel in the distress that he saw right when he came off the boat. But like Cedric's long term goal, the whole point of him being on this continent in the first place is to be a missionary, right? I think he's made that pretty plain. And that was something that did not get addressed during the colonizer conversation last time, right? When when Casper said, Oh, bring me information about land features and natural resources and indigenous peoples, and Artemis was like, What? There might already be people living here? What are you talking about? <laughs> and like she she was upset about that idea, but like that's kind of the whole reason Cedric's here, isn't it? So mm-hmm. like how do we how do we think uh, or what do we think about Cedric's role to play? You know, because we sort of were down on Fletcher that like, oh, Fletcher's being the foil for this. And like, you know, he's being the colonizer. But like, Cedric's kind of a colonizer too, I, right? I so of, like, can we, can we talk in. about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, Jokes. I didn't mean to kick you off. Oh, no. I, I was saying I sort of brought that <laughs> up in that episode. Um, and I think we talked about it a little bit. Um, when we were talking about material versus non-material things that we were taking mm-hmm. from from the mm-hmm. land, but, yeah. Um, yeah, it would be really interesting to see. It, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, we brought that up, but you know, this is something that we should really focus on, and I'd like your opinion on it. Yeah, no, there. I mean, I, I feel like in all of our conversations, right, there are a thousand yeah. different threads that we could follow, and and we, we're never going to be able to follow all the ones that we would love to explore. But yeah, I mean, absolutely, right. Uh, missionaries are the I mean, in in our world, are always at the forefront, have always been at the forefront of colonization and exploitation of Native peoples and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and Native lands. And uh, so, I, honestly, like, I, I, I think with Cedric, it's an exploratory mission. He doesn't really know what to expect. Um, and, I, and I know that sounds a little bit... Um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, I half-assed, 
but but with with so with the building off of the the um the mythology of Moradin, right dwarves are better than everybody else right um and so i think he's he's trying to see what's out there um if there are other dwarven people out there that's going to be a big deal for cedric um he definitely is gonna i mean that's that's top priority if there are other dwarves here we need to contact them we need to teach them about more and we need to like refine them into the purest metal that we can um <laughs> if if there are other cultures here we, we need to figure out what we can take from them so like that's to me like that's the the real colonizer mentality in in the more mission is like yeah. If all the other cultures are so, like, let's say dwarves are iron, right, or mm-hmm. whatever, can we take you and make an ally, an alloy, out of out of whatever you have, and to make ourselves better? So they're um, kind of like mercury. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Um, so like you, may, yeah, you may be a, a toxic poisonous metal, but perhaps we can make you know something something interesting or better out of mixing us together easy uh, to extract the gold yeah. <laughs> sure um yeah uh yeah i haven't watched quite enough now red videos to to really <laughs> be able to, to really um uh come up with a good metaphor there but but yeah like dwarves are, finding other dwarves is number one priority finding something to improve the dwarven people or culture is yeah. number two and and that's not necessarily like I mean, that's not a biological alloy that he's thinking, but more of a cultural mm-hmm. exploitation. Can I take, can I find something that's going to, that's going to be able to help refine us? Yeah. So he wants, so he wants both um, intellectual and material goods. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think actually more intellectual goods than, than material, which is kind of atypical for a dwarf, right? Like, yeah. I mean, gold blah 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 <laughs> is is i think dwarven you know priority but i think specifically for cedric it's more about like cultural i want to be able to like learn stuff and take it back to my people and, and make yeah. my people better um and and maybe that's you know maybe that's magic maybe it's cultural practices but it's it's something that he wants to be able to to take back which i think is very you know counter you know when we look at um specifically Christian missionaries in, in our world. Um, you know, the, the part of the Christian missionary mission is to convert other souls. <clears throat> well, for, for Moradin, it's, it's almost to, to, to really hit the parallel. It's almost more like the Jewish faith faith where it's like, no, we're, we're the chosen people. We're not trying to convert you and bring you to us. Right. Like Christianity has, has this kind of ethos of, we are converting non-Christians, bringing them into us. That's part of our saving our, them. Yeah, yeah, saving them. Yeah. yeah, that's part of our ideology. It's part of our mission. <laughs> Whereas Judaism is like, nah, we're the chosen people. We're good. Like we're, <laughs> trying, we're trying to, not, you know, we're just trying to, to hang out here and, and be left alone. And and we, it'd be great if you guys could stop murdering us. <laughs> oh, jeez, wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, it, it's, it, but, so, not just, you know, again, those are, those are examples of the real mm-hmm. world. Cedric's religion is not a parallel to either of those or, or in any way related, but I was just using this. It's, it's a way to compare and explain. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's good. And I, I really like Cedric as Please a character. Oh, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> for, for those parallels, this is, it's not related at all. Yeah. No, I I really like Cedric as a character. So, um, and also Cedric Cedric is not me, right? right. Like that's I mean, yeah. like I I'm building Cedric's experiences off of some experiences that I've had, but but Cedric's experiences and, and beliefs and everything like that are are not not reflective of who I am as a person. No. Yeah, and that's that's why we play this game, right? Is to be able to take on the mantle of another person. I joke all the time. They're like, "Oh, D and D was so that nerds could pretend they were like big muscly dudes running around with swords, saving girls." Because 
you know, but like, honestly, like, it's true. It appeals to the theater nerd in me that like, I get to be <laughs> someone completely different than me if I want, or, or in this case, I get to be a cast of thousands and play literally <laughs> everyone. But yeah, like, you, you know, you get to, you get to try on the skin and experiences and thoughts of someone who isn't you. Yeah. And sometimes that means we get to indulge our bad sides or our obnoxious sides. And like, that's, it's safe to do it inside the game. Yeah. Right. Well, and yeah. speaking for myself, I, I'm doing the exact opposite. So <laughs> um, Lucanus is based on, he's, a lot of the things that are going to factor into the story are based on things that I've experienced, and they're based on um, social approaches that I'm, you know, that I have to use, because as I, um, because he, because of the sorts of things that, um uh, there's a lot of parallels between in the D and D, you know, mythos and the you know the stuff that Cheryl sent us between like how barbarians are treated and how people like me are treated, and we'll get a lot more into that, you know, a lot yeah. longer on down the road. But um, it's different people are taking different things from this, and it's really interesting to see how, um, you know, Cheryl, you mentioned your history in theater and. Um, Peter mentioned his history with church and it's really interesting to see how people's um, oh and we also discussed this with Nancy her inspiration mm -hmm. with Kay and you know just sort of somebody living in the place already when people come to we'll just say visit to be nice yeah <laughs> um, and uh, uh, everybody's taking all of these really interesting experiences from their lives and putting them into their characters and it's really cool to see how different people's experiences are even though we're all scientists who study similar stuff <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think i mean you know to go back to the the whole point of this whole thing I mean, that's like <laughs> to humanize scientists right yeah and, and I, I think ultimately the 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 most basic takeaway is that we're all people and people are very different and like the fact that we're all entomologists really has no bearing on who we are as people. Yeah. I mean like, you know, Oh, Hey, I like this thing, but it's kind of like people who like the same band. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, like you're like, Oh, you, when you're, you know, when you're 14, you're like, Oh, you know, like, Oh, they like the same band as I do. Like we should be best friends. And you're like, Oh, we're, we're not even remotely the same just because they, we both like bright eyes or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's, I think I think that's that's a really I think it's a very fundamental idea that is very easy to dismiss, right? It's yeah. Like not all entomologists are the I don't know whatever the public thinks entomologists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think you know we whatever you know whether it's our backgrounds, or our interests, or you know who we're <clears throat> married to or where we live or whatever, you know, it's, it, we're, we're very diverse kind of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I think is, is apparent even in these first two episodes, you know, I mean, like yeah. when you look at the way that our characters have interacted and with the, the way we've interacted, I mean, I mean, the way that you have played, I mean, Lucanus so far, <laughs> I, think, I mean, and the way, and the way that you talk about how you've designed your character, I think is, is <laughs> so telling of, you as a person and how, yeah. how um, intentional you are in the way that you storytell. And I think, I mean, like, when you compare that to, I mean, to like the way I play, which is very much like I play from the gut. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like I, um, as much as it pains me to say, I am a Gryffindor. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say, like, I, you know, you can, I, from the DM's point of view, you can tell so much about these players by who responded to my emails asking them more questions about their characters, and Peter was not one of yeah. them. <laughs> it's like, I'll figure it out, I'll figure it out. He's like, I don't know. I'm behind on 800 other emails, because I haven't responded. Yeah, no, I, uh... <laughs> So I, I originally I originally was very loose with um, with some of the interpretations with my character, but now that I've played a little bit and now that we've like 
brought up certain questions like what happens when a character dies i've gotten a lot more ideas and i've been meaning to send like several dozen emails to cheryl about oh boy. <laughs> whereas, whereas i've been like mm, i don't know I'll figure it out when i cross that bridge yeah and, that, yeah. and that's fine yeah. yeah um it does mean that sometimes you get surprised by trying to interact with someone in your church but you know like it, and, and yeah. it's fun because this is this is one big crazy improv story session and so like yeah you can take you can take whatever tack you want, and and yeah. I appreciate that, right? Um, yeah, so, I, I think it's fun. <laughs> so going going back to Cedric's time in Arda, um, the first thing that he saw was um, a uh, uh, um, sex worker in a brothel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, why is that something that he noticed <laughs> or really even cared about? Because I handed um, it to him, but also... <laughs> <laughs> No, don't spoil I'm the magic, sure Cheryl. The perception check. <laughs> so, all right. So, like, as far as the way I play Cedric, I don't think he's particularly. Um, dwarven culture is very commerce based. Um, I don't think that dwarven culture. I mean, at least. Whatever. I'm sorry, everybody who's read every drizzit you know, novel ever is going to say, you know, like, oh, no, actually. But in my mind, it's like, no, you're exchanging goods for services. Like, sex work to me makes sense. Um, and I think it does to Cedric as well. Um, and so uh, so to me, it was like, oh, this is sex work. And But then when she specifically asked for help, it was like, oh, this is this is not sex work. This is, this is a woman asking for help. This is and forced labor. Yeah, exactly. And forced labor for a, a man who is very, you know, commerce based in his mindset is, oh, this is slavery. This is not OK. Right. Yeah. This is this is services in exchange for no goods, which is not OK. Um, and so. Uh, so, yeah. So that was a very like immediate switch for Cedric. Um, and I think, you know, his impulse was, you know, run in there and start lopping off heads, but are crushing heads. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think he was like, oh, this is a new town. I got I got to rein it in a little bit. We got to do everything the right way. Yeah. Just, Emphasis you know, was, on a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think. Uh, you know, yeah, it was, he walked up the boat. That was the first thing he saw. And that was, he, he reacted in a very like natural way to him. Yeah. My, my first uh, silly question or maybe not so silly question is um, if, if you don't like the idea of forced labor, then how do we feel about internships that are unpaid? Because, (laughs) because I've definitely had this before, not even for internships, but like for jobs where I was um, what I would consider um, like, when I worked in a different industry than I am now. Um, but I definitely had the experience where I felt like I was being severely underpaid, but the job was like, Oh, but you, we also provided you with a dorm to stay in and we're feeding you. Right. So it's like, you know, the brothel owner could conceivably make the same argument, right? Like, Oh, well I clothe her and feed her and she has a safe place to sleep. Right. So like, you know, maybe it's not such a silly question to be like, oh, well, unpaid internships and like weird summer jobs where you don't get paid very much because they're giving you a dorm to sleep in. Like, how, you know, where is the continuum between right, uh, you know, rightfully or, tr- or or fairly employed and unfairly employed? Yeah, no, I think I think continuum is the exact right word there. Right? <clears throat> like you've got um, the, the, there are definitely scenarios where, um, you know, I think woofing, you know, if you guys are familiar with the, the woof program, W W O O F, it's, it's a, uh, I think it stands for <laughs> worldwide organization of organic farming or something. Oh like yeah. It's a voluntary that. internship program where people go and they basically, they, they work <laughs> the farm labor or in exchange for food and board. Um, I mean, you compare I mean, like that. I think, I think you have a, a spectrum, right, where uh, you you go from this is a voluntary thing. I'm choosing to, you know, work for food and board. I think that's great. But you also have the other end of the spectrum, you know, which is, you know, ba- I mean, basically what we had, you know, a hundred years ago in the United States, where people were working for script, and you're you're locked into a scenario, um, and I mean, basically it boils down to, are you free to leave or not? And that's a very ephemeral, 
kind mm-hmm. of quality. And so I think that that's what that's that's where that that continuum comes into play, right? It's, there's a lot of gray area between like, hey, you're getting services for your services, right? Like that's you, you know I I I believe that people should be able to be paid in non monetary goods, right? Like I think you know it's the socialist in all of us, right? You know, <laughs> We believe that I, I should be able to like work for an, you know a couple hours and get paid in a dozen eggs or whatever. Yeah. Um, that makes sense um, from a very fundamental human point of view. But I should be also be able to leave. And and I think uh, what you see in a lot of uh, scenarios where workers are being treated unfairly is people are being, um, you know. It, ch- they're they're locked into either some kind of debt situation where it's like oh yes you can you know live here and you're working and it's paying off of you know i mean so i mean like when the you know the the early you know white settlers that came over to north america as indentured servants right like that's you know it's like you're you're working to pay off your previous debt um and and you're you you get locked into some kind of cycle of well you your living expenses outweigh your debt. And so your debt is continuous or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, see, I, I me, love for me. It's, oh, it's more of a grid situation than, you know, just a line continuum because like you can, so <laughs> unpaid work that actually gives you a lot of skills. I, I feel is worth it. I've been in those situations, but I'm also lucky enough to be able to, you know, eat some of the, eat some of the, um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have the time constraints, the you know, the, enough free time to you know not pay me. And mm-hmm. um, but there's also paid there's also paid positions, which um, I refer to these as predatory jobs. So somebody hires, you know, like predatory journals. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing, only with <clears throat> employment. So um, with uh, uh, you know with with a lab that will pay an undergrad to wash dishes that's not worth it for the undergrad because, mm-hmm. you know, even though they're getting paid, which by the way is good. Um, it doesn't really pay off for them in the long term if they're not developing skills in those positions, if they never leave the dishwasher. Um, in a similar vein, uh, there's also, um, so there's a book that I think that we should, um, require every undergrad to read. And it's called from Kelly girls to Permatemps" by Aaron Hatton. And in this book, she's a sociologist of labor, and she describes how um, temp agencies have essentially created a whole new workforce called permatemps. And what these what these agencies do is they um, will lock people into jobs, purposely not give them any sort of career development, and then um, uh, uh, essentially use that lack of development to keep those employees in the same job for as long as possible because it's very difficult for them to move on. And some companies in the U S might be filled with more than 50% perm attempts, even, Mm -hmm. even though it's explicitly like illegal to, to keep people on as temporary employees for decades at a time. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I, I like a lot of the things you guys said. Um, I was so pleased, Peter, that you mentioned the idea of script, though. I grew up in yeah. Pennsylvania, and we learned a lot about um, coal mine towns and all the weird situations <laughs> going on there. And I think that, yeah, yeah. Um, temp agencies and um, coal mine towns and sharecropping and indentured servitude all tie back into this idea of sex work and like, okay, well a lot of these people chose to be here, but then like once you've chosen, is that choice taken away from you, right? Like you you may or may not have chosen to enter this situation, but now that you're here, you don't get to choose to leave. And like, that's like, Carissa is a very dramatic example that like, yes, you could argue she probably is a yeah. slave because she said her father sold her to this guy, right? But like a lot of other people who wind up in sex work are like, well, I ran away from home because the situation there was terrible, but I needed a way to feed myself and I didn't have any other skills kind of thing. So like, you know, how do we like, well, you know, how, how do people get stuck into this far, and then not able to leave? It's far more complicated than that. So yeah. um, for anybody who's watching yeah. this, there's um, a podcast. There's two podcasts <laughs> that you should listen to, both done by um, John Ronson, who uh, uh, wrote. Um, so you so you've been shamed or so you've public been publicly shamed. And 
this guy is fascinating because um, in the um, uh, in his podcast, The Butterfly Effect, which was later which was later titled titled Last Days of August for reasons that I'll talk about, he actually looks at the um, the uh, uh, social influence that Pornhub has had and essentially having a lot of porn online for free. And again, this is sex work, but it also applies to other areas of the economy. But having so much porn online for free, um, essentially what it did was it turned people who are making a lot of money back when people had to, you know, buy videos and DVDs and stuff like that, besides, um, and not get it online for free. Um, essentially what it did was it shrunk the workforce. But the problem with that is that somebody finds out that you're a porn star and he actually used an example of a male porn star and granted women have it far worse. So what I'm about to describe to you, imagine what it would be like if it was a woman, because it's, it's far worse for women. But, um, essentially there was a guy who had worked in the adult film industry for, you know, 20, 30 years. And when the internet came up, he's like, Oh, I'll just become a nurse. And he got a job as a nurse, and then somebody found out what he had done, that he was a porn star, and the hospital actually came to him, and they're like, you are a liability to us because if somebody wants to sue the hospital, all they had, all they have to do is say that you were sexually intimidating to them. Mm -hmm. So they fired him, and he has not been able to find work um, in, the nursing, um, in the nursing field, which is you know, where he spent a lot of money and spent a lot of time to get his education – um, and, uh, he can't work in that field. He can't get out of porn, basically. Mm -hmm. Like he is trapped in that career because he can't get a job doing anything else. Um, and, uh, um, the, uh, uh podcast last day days of August, which I'm just mentioning so that you can find the butterfly effect because, when podcasts retitle themselves, I don't know what the hell happens with the search, <laughs> but um, he actually goes through how um, uh, a very, essentially there was a porn star who committed suicide. And what he does is he traces back the last years of her life and tries to figure out what happened to um, make her, um, you know, choose to take, um, choose to um, take her life in that way. And it gets into a lot of really other um, sociological um, problems with the porn industry, which are beyond the scope of this podcast. But again, certainly something that I want to plug for people who want to understand more about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would, I would also plug um, for um, anybody that has not listened to the Strange Bedfellows podcast. Um, oh, that's one I'm not familiar with. Yeah, it's uh, so L. Um, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Stanger um, is a uh, uh, social media um, person that I follow um, on Instagram. And she posts a lot of stuff about sex work. Um, she's a stripper and she posts a lot of stuff about all, all different sorts of sex work. I would definitely um, suggest that people uh, check out her podcast. Um, definitely exploring sex work from the point of view of someone who is actually involved in, in yeah. sex work. Um, uh, and, but yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It's, it's, it's a, um, it's a topic that has <laughs> layers upon layers of stigma, which integrate yeah. in with sociological issues and economic issues. And yeah, I mean, it's definitely way beyond what we could talk about here, especially the three of us who yeah. are not <laughs> involved in it at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. Oh, and I've, know, I've had some conversations with um, uh, sex workers, um, specifically porn stars on, on, you know, Twitter accounts and stuff like that. And I, I always feel really nervous mentioning that I've had these sorts of interactions because it, I feel like, I feel like um, whenever I talk about having these interactions with these people, it sort of, um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It makes, it sort of devalues the conversations I have because people assume that I'm coming at it not more from a kind of pervy angle rather than from a topic of, of interest. But again, this is something that we really need, I feel like really needs to be discussed because 
that stigma, whether even, even whether talking about it, interacting with these people, or them trying to leave a collapsing industry, really, really hurts literally everybody involved. Yeah, I, I would love to build off of that because I, I also like I, I, I would like to be because it's something I, I feel strongly about. Like I, I believe that sex work should be legal. I believe yes. that it should be well regulated. I, I think it should be safe for the people that are involved, right? Like I feel yeah. like that will that will not I mean obviously it's not a perfect solution, but I think that will solve a lot of the problems that we have with sex work. Sex but, work is work. Yeah. Sex work is work. Thank you. Yeah. It's a great way to put it. Yeah. And it, it should be treated as all the other you know they should be it should be protected. I mean yeah. even more so than so many other uh, workplaces that we have yeah they need additional protection um but yes as a as a as a man it is very interesting to be in a scenario where i feel like i cannot advocate safely for someone else where like in any other issue if i am advocating for say my my gay friends i feel as a cis man as a cis straight man i i can go out there and say like we need to absolutely do this to protect people who are gay. And as a man, I feel like I can absolutely say we need to do this to protect people who are women. And as a, and, and but sex work is one of those things where I feel like, yeah, with, I, I am scared to advocate for it because of the stigma associated with being potentially a patron of sex. Mm -hmm. work. Yeah. And, and, and that is very interesting to 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 be in a scenario where you're like, oh, this could actually blow back on me. You know, like it, I think it, it highlights the privilege that you and I have as as straight white men. You know, that yeah, we we are yeah. like we are so comfortable in our position that it's like, yeah, hey, I can be like, oh, you know, whatever, you know, LGBTQ rights. I yeah, you know, I support that, but yeah. like, you know, and, and be so comfortable in our position that we can advocate for that without worrying about ramifications of that yeah but, but it's like oh but this one or you know i mean there it's not the only one but it, here's an example where it's like oh this could actually you know have have potential you know awkwardness associated with it and yeah. that was illustrated pretty well by the group in <laughs> these episodes right like they're there were jokes about the priest. There were jokes about Cedric. There were jokes about yeah. Lucanus. Like the, the, it's, it's a thing. And, and that joking is all covering up like discomfort too. Right. Mm. But like, yeah, this is, yeah. that, that was really well illustrated that like, yeah, let me, let me, I, we should go rescue this girl from this brothel. And like, Oh really? Because yeah. like, yeah, there's all of this like weird stuff surrounding that. And so, well, yeah, like, <laughs> I even made a joke. I know it was a weird I know it was a weird quest to set first but like you know yeah. it does a it does a lot for us to like sort of understand the characters and and you know how they think about the world yeah. to deal with this problem. And that's that's a really good point. Um in fact I even made a joke that in retrospect I kind of regret making but we can talk about it but I sort of referred to um Carissa as uh, Cedric's brothel girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Oh, I totally missed that. He did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he yeah. did. He called her that. And, and I actually, I would like to say that I made the joke so that I could bring it up and sort of um, discuss how, like, how um, uh, uh, people sort of make light and devalue sex work. But mm -hmm. I honestly wasn't even thinking about that at the time i just sort of said something that i thought would be funny and now in this con now only in this context when we're talking about what we understand to be the struggles of sex work um which again as as peter pointed out earlier none of us are involved um in that so we don't have any firsthand experience but in just this context when we're talking about how basically sex how difficult sex work is mm -hmm. and how you know, harmful it can be. Um, I realized that the joke that I made was maybe a bit counterproductive because it it was using humor to sort of um, reinforce the thing that you know Peter and I talked about. You know, feeling uncomfortable as men who are trying to advocate for sex workers. So. But I I think, 
and to to get real meta about this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> when we talk, I mean, like when we talk about science as a whole, right? Like part of it is including the errors in the data and 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 using those as learning experiences. Right? Yeah. You, you all right? Say so you said this thing that was a fuck up or what? Whatever. I mean, like I. But I think I think that is important to then take it and use it as a learning experience. And I think that's why these chats are fun because you get to kind of talk back and uh, yeah, I'm we can work this. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, I mean, and I think SciComm, absolutely. Like you go back and you read my early Twitter <laughs> feed, I'm sure it is a dumpster fire. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, like, I, I, and I think that's scary. It's very scary for me as somebody who is trying to portray themselves as a scientist on social media or whatever yeah it's a it's a question that i'm constantly having of like you know if i the more i put of myself on there the more potential there is for risk of me to say the wrong thing or or whatever um and i think that's the, i think that's one of the great things that i like about this idea is it's so much and so fast that we really give kind of lose the chance to control the narrative and you know yeah. Um, like, you know, when I talk about an Instagram posts, it's like, yeah, I could, I could spend an hour and a half cultivating like the perfect, you know, three paragraphs to say, you know, that this beetle species is interesting because of this paper that came out in 1982 or whatever. And, um, <laughs> maybe. um, but yeah, like I, I, I like this. It, 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 it yeah. takes, it takes that away and it's more honest, right? You're like, Hey, I, you know, sometimes I say bad things. Now I get to rework rework that and discuss it and whatever and maybe we'll touch on it again if people have feelings yeah. about it. I, and again this is this is this whole idea of like why we do this right we put ourselves on the internet and are fools and yeah sometimes say maybe things that aren't exactly perfect because like people get to be people and the more um the more different kinds of people we are able to um interact with even if it's you know forming a relationship with them because you see them yeah. being themselves on the internet twice a month that kind of thing right like um the more different kinds of people we can form relationships with the better our own personal empathy gets and like hopefully the better the world gets um so yeah. <laughs> like yeah i think that you know all of these things and 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 it's also you know you were saying like oh it's so scary like what if i say the wrong thing because this game is so fast paced and like yeah, it's hard for me because like, you know, Rebecca was so immediately upset about Casper and I'm like, oh man, I have to play all of the bad guys, right? Like yeah. I have to I have to play all of the bad guys and I'm also the omniscient bad guy because I'm also the one choosing like how do I throw these five very thoughtful, very intelligent people into a bunch of circumstances where they're going to have to like, ah shit, now I have to figure my way out of this, right? Like yeah. like I I hate having to like be the bad guy and think about all of this stuff. But at the same yeah. time, like it's really interesting too, right? Like, Oh, well, how will they react to this? And I think that's, you know, yeah. it's, it's an important exercise in empathy in itself. But, so but yeah, the, over, I love... the broader overall point that I, that I was trying to make by pointing out this joke that I had made is that, mm -hmm. you know, even the jokes that we make, even if we talk about these things in good faith in other contexts, we have to realize that, they can communicate harmful attitudes. Mm -hmm. And um, I was sort of expressing a little bit of guilt over overdoing yeah. um, exactly that. And it, it should be it should be recognized that that's exactly what what that is and was. Right. But I think that's that's the point of this again, that like, OK, well, so you said it, but like then we're going to talk about it. Right. Yeah. Like that's yeah. that's the thing that like you are both a human. And so people are like, oh, it's relatable. I sometimes say gaffy things, too. But like there was a thought process afterwards. It was like, Oh, I really wish I could have like, oh, like pulled that yeah. back. Right. So like, you know, and talking about why. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's so, the, that's the piece that like, if this wasn't happening, then it would be bad. But because this is happening, that is not nearly as bad yeah. because like we're, well, we're and, learning from it. It's and, growing. And right. So to, to bring it sort of back to the original context of, of sex work, it also gives, um, you know, the, it also gives us a jumping off point to talk about the sort of catch 22s and, um, uh, uh, it gives us a point, a jumping off point to talk about the catch 22s and all the sort of hypocrisies that hurt people in these professions. Um, which mm -hmm. is sort of why I brought it up because I wanted to point out, you know, all of that stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah so, um, 
Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit more about what you do, like in in real life, in your day job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I so I work for the Agricultural Extension Service, which is a uh, in a really interesting network um, created about a hundred years ago um, by the federal government. Uh, but run by every state in the United States. Um, so people who aren't familiar with agricultural extension, uh, basically the federal government mandated that every state would extend the resources of their land grant universities to everybody who lives in their state. Um, that that was part of the mission of the land grant universities. Um, and if you're not familiar with what a land grant university is, um, it's it's one of your state colleges where whichever state you live in you know it's 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 probably one of the big ones um so in maryland it's the university of maryland and the university of maryland eastern shore are two land grant universities um university of maryland is uh the original land grant university and the university of maryland eastern shore is our historically black university which is created because the university of maryland didn't want to integrate african-american students um so they the, the basically there was a separate university established for that um this was you know in the late 1800s pre you know uh, or still during segregation so um the 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 idea behind extension was all this research is being done at the land grant universities and we want people to take the research being done at these land grant universities and extend it out to the communities um, and that, and that at the time, the idea was people are learning to be better engineers and better blacksmiths and better farmers and better chemists and better scientists and better pharmacists. And we want we want to take this information being generated at the university level and and take it out to the communities where it can really make an economic and, and a humanitarian impact on, on people. <laughs> That's a long way of saying that. My job is to take the research that's being done in agriculture at the university level and take it out to the community and, and teach it to farmers. Farmers, almost every farmer in Carroll County knows more about farming than I do, but my job is to keep them up to date on whatever new research is coming out, whatever our, you know cool stuff is going on at the university level or the national level. Um, I do a lot of regulatory and um, education, um, keeping people up to date on food safety or pesticide regulations or new integrated pest management practices, um, new resistance management practices, uh, new you know genetically modified organisms that are coming out, um, all kinds of different uh, things. Um, so my job, uh, so. Uh, almost every county in the nation has somebody who does my job, which is agriculture extension. So to teach farmers in that county stuff. Um, so so my, my position is University of Maryland, my county is Carroll County, and my specialty is small farms. So there's one other agent in my county who also does agriculture, which is pretty unique, actually. Uh, it's not doesn't occur much. Most counties only have one person uh, who's who does my job. Carroll County is lucky, and then they have two, or or unlucky. And then... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm an entomologist. Um, my background is in integrated pest management of agricultural pests. Um, I, my master's degree is in sustainable pest management practices and how they affect pest and beneficial insect numbers in vegetable fields. And uh, so I, I work with farmers to try and improve crop yields by managing insect pests. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's way more background than you wanted. <laughs> by the way, stop by my poster at ESA this year. I have something to show you. Hell yeah. I'll be there. <laughs> stop, by, stop by my poster. I'll be at... I, Ryan is, who plays Fletcher, is having a, uh, a symposium on um, uh, alternative careers with entomology. Um, and I'm giving a, I'll be giving a poster on extension, cooperative extension as a career opportunity. Nice. So I mean, anybody that's out there that's considering, what do I do with an entomology degree? 
cooperative extension, educating people, yeah. being paid by a university to basically teach entomology um, is, is, a, is, a, is a very interesting and rewarding career um, for the right type of person. <laughs> yeah. So if, if they wanted to come by and talk to me about it, I'm, I'm there. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so you essentially um, educate um, farmers about new techniques and um, stuff that's just coming out. What are some of the difficulties about doing that? Hmm. Because I know um, I know that there's a lot of times a lot of um, sort of skepticism about stuff that's just coming out and the fact that you know <laughs> you haven't really worked on on the farm background because as you said they know more about farming than you do and that's true of me as well because I also do <laughs> agriculture. Um, so what what sort of issues do you see sort of revolving around? What sort of issues do you see springing from either your lack of hands-on experience or um, uh, uh, just sort of skepticism of new data? Oh, man. You got another hour? To <laughs> <laughs> oh, at this rate. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, okay, so, uh, I mean, in summary, I mean, I think the issues that I deal with day-to-day, -day, I mean, specifically with... Um, ideas about new data, which is yeah. what you asked about. Um, farmers are very willing to listen, but very skeptical to adopt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, farmers have have always, I mean, I would say within the last 60, 70 years, um, been willing to pay attention to new research coming out. I mean, I think there there is a lot of reticence to change but there is a willingness to listen. <clears throat> the thing that drives adoption is hard data, right? Like farmers need to be, they are willing to listen to you present new information, but they, they really need to be convinced that there's something there. Um, so, so overwhelmingly, I would say the biggest barrier to change is just really good evidence showing whatever it is that you're trying to push is going to be better. And I think uh, a big part of that is that research generally leans really heavily on uh, a lot of, um, like uh, relationships between different organisms in the field. I mean, ag agricultural research, right? We're just talking specifically about agricultural research that you mm -hmm. can say like, hey, we did this thing and increase the number of beneficial insects and that maybe you have the data to prove, oh, this may be improved yield this much. I think overall farmers are looking at this as a business practice. And so you really have to look I think for as as hard scientists, it's very hard for most researchers to couch everything within the practice of the idea of a, of a business practice. It's like if I do X, how much will it increase my profit margin? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people like to imagine that farming is not a business, but it is. It, and yeah you know, you couch it in the best intentions, you have the farmer with the best intentions. If they don't make any money two years from now, they're not going to be farming. Mm -hmm. years from now, You know, like they, things have to make money yet. You know, even, even if they are the most open-minded IPM oriented farmer ever, they have to be able to make enough money to keep doing it. Yeah. Um, that's, I think that's the biggest adoption is this kind of <clears throat> about like uh yeah that's that's some that's some nice data that's some nice research there's some of the cool pictures of bugs or whatever but how much is it going to improve my my profit margin mm -hmm. yeah uh, and i think i think so you mentioned ipm and for those of for those of you who are listening who aren't familiar with the concept of, of pest management integrated pest management is um you know, it's it's essentially trying to get people away from what we call spray and pray. You know, just sort of spray the field with pesticide every all, every so often, and you know, pray that takes the problem away. And there's a lot of issues um, with this that haven't really got, gotten out into the public sphere. So, for example, one of the things they do, we know 
what level of insect will cause what level of monetary crop damage. So there's a lot of a lot of agricultural research is just basically trying to figure out the the number of insect is basically trying to um, translate insect populations into dollar amounts for crop loss. But one of the issues getting people to count those insects before they spray with pesticides to make sure that they're actually saving money by doing that is the perception of risk. Because if you pay somebody to go out and they count and they say that you don't need to treat, that is sort of viewed as a negative because you just sort of paid somebody to tell you that you don't need to do something. Whereas if they say yes, well, you were probably going to do it anyways right. sometime soon. And, and I mean, you look at the cheap synthetic fiber products, you know, like it, it may be cheaper to go ahead and spray than it is to pay somebody to go out and spray. Yeah. But with insecticide resistance, how long is that going to be the case? <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a whole other, you know, complicated issue is, you yeah. know, trying to you know, the, trying to to teach insecticide resistance in a way that that it is really a compelling argument for people, um, so that they can understand it. Because yeah. I think most farmers want the vast majority of farmers they want to be good custodians of the chemicals they use and their land and their crops and all of those things. But trying to trying to communicate what is you think the best way to to be uh, a custodian of all of those things is pretty difficult. Yeah, mm-hmm. especially especially if you're coming from an urban area because, you know, you go to St. Louis, look for green space. They actually do, I, I St. Louis is very good at designating green space, but you look out and, you know, you don't really see much environment whereas, you know, you go out into um the rural areas and I mean, you're going to see a lot of environmental destruction because you know, agriculture is what it is, but you're going to see a lot more of it than you do in cities. Yeah. Yeah. So. And I, I don't want to like cut us off awkwardly, but I also know that it's almost 1 a.m. where Peter is. Oh, shit. <laughs> so yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to keep you too long and we'll certainly have you on nature chat again, where we can talk more about what you do for your job because yeah, yeah I, I definitely love, um, extension education and it is incredibly yeah. valuable and i'm just always so sad that more people don't know it exists yeah. um so yeah thank you peter got, for we got talking more, to us about stuff we got more <laughs> ag storylines coming so as, yeah as evidenced by this this chat i am more than willing to talk for way too long <laughs> yeah things, so, well and, the problem is i'm the same way <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, I would I would encourage anyone to reach out to their local extension educators. Um, wherever you are, you have extension educators whose job it is to chat with you about you know whatever it is that you want to talk to them about. Gardening, your lawn, doing programs for schools, like they do it all. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and 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 me too. If any, I mean, like uh, I think most people on Twitch are like pretty guarded about their. Uh, contact information if you want to call me at work uh my work <laughs> number is on the internet if you want to give me a call i'm up there <laughs> uh one of my admins will direct you to my office and i will i will answer your questions about whatever so i'm, I'm it's my job <laughs> yep yep uh I, yeah with with ask an entomologist we have some emails that have uh sort of caused me to um <laughs> Let, just let me put it this way. We'll talk at ESA about. Uh, we have a lot to talk about at ESA, and I have life some on stories. the internet. Yeah, I have some stories about life on the internet. I think you'll find interesting. So, um, well, yeah. thank you everyone for spending your life on the internet here with us. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, thank you everybody for um, watching, and uh, we'll be back on, like we said, July sixth, the first. Saturday of July with episode three of Nature Check. So please come check it out. Um, it looks like the PCs are going to start with some combat and then talk about all kinds of plant related things um, and maybe yeah. also sea turtles. And who doesn't love sea turtles? So yeah. tune in for that. Um, you can also, of course, find everyone's contact information down in the reference section. So go follow all of these lovely people. And uh, yeah, 